Hi, and welcome. Uh, this is Headwaters Science Institute. I'm Meg Seifert, the Executive Director, and we have Megan Joyce. Go ahead, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Megan Joyce. I do a bunch of science communications for uh, Headwaters and a couple of other organizations, including Reverse the Red. Awesome. And as part of our community outreach programs, um, Headwaters has uh, another live talk for you guys tonight. Um, we have um, Austin Parker, who's here uh, to talk about his research. And um, before we get started, we also wanted to mention that April is Citizen Science Month and Earth Day. So there's a bunch of exciting um, opportunities coming up for you all to get involved in wildlife conservation and going out and um, taking observations. And we've sent out a backyard bird challenge with your registration. And we'll also send it out again tomorrow after, um, after the talk. But um, we wanted to uh, provide some background information on what a uh, wildlife biologist does. So that is why we'd like to welcome Austin tonight. Welcome Austin. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Right. And we are hoping that you'll share a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. You're the co-founder and host of Pelicanus and also a wildlife biologist. So feel free to uh, introduce and, and share a bit about your work. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna get started and uh, just share my screen just so you know I can introduce myself when you guys don't actually have to see my face. Let's see, entire screen. All right, and then Megan, let me know if you can see everything correctly. Yes? Yeah, you're good. Sorry. Okay, great. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Yep. Yeah, everything looks perfect. Okay, great. So yes, um, my name is Austin Parker. I'm a wildlife biologist. I My full-time job is I work for the USGS um, as a biologist. Um, and then I'm also the president and co-founder of Pelicanus Inc., a uh, small nonprofit that we created a couple of years ago off of a project that I started eight years ago. Uh, uh, yeah, about eight years ago now, kind of crazy. Um, and we'll talk about all that in, in a second. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, get to the, the cool photos first, because that's the more interesting part. Um, real quick, this photo is one of two or three photos of me smiling <laughs> that I can find ever. Um, but it is a really cool photo because those are peregrine falcons that we got to uh, band and as part of a monitoring program. And yeah, that's about as about as good as it gets in this field is being able to handle uh, these, we call them murder chickens, where they have <laughs> like giant feet and, you know, within a few months they're, they're taking pigeons out of the sky at 200 miles an hour. So, uh, okay. So I am uh, a, like I said, a wildlife biologist, but I live in Southern California. And technically that, I guess that means I am an urban wildlife uh, biologist and that's not really out of something I didn't grow up in. Like I really want to be an urban wildlife biologist, but it just kind of comes out of necessity of living and working in Southern California because it's extremely urbanized. And so you get species like this. These cute little guys, the coyotes. Um, and so we do different projects, uh, like a camera trap study where you put out camera traps in these urban urbanized uh, pr preserve areas and you get to see what's there and, and uh, you know, it's all just kind of fun on top of all the research that you can do and get really good information. Um, I grew up kind of going outside uh, with the family. We would go camping um, and my dad was a birder and so I think I just kind of naturally gravitated towards birds when I started getting into this field. I also feel like it's because they're a little bit ubiqu ubiquitous. Pretty much everywhere you go, there's birds. It's like birds and plants. So if you're trying to get into this field, birds and plants are a really good way to do it. <laughs> um, and then here in Southern California, um, there's a couple of species of concern. And on the coastal side of Southern Cal California, there are two birds that I've worked with for the last, I don't even know, eight, nine, 10 years. 
Um, the one on the right is a California gnat catcher, this little gray bird that has a black head. It sounds like a little kitty cat when it, when it calls. Um, unfortunately, this isn't a video, so you can't hear it, but uh, cute little bird. They're, they're a federally endangered species that I actually have a permit to, to survey for. Um, and the cactus run on the left. Um, and these guys are a great example of uh, why I love wildlife. It's always about, for me, it's for whatever reason, it's about adaptations. And you can see a, a coworker of mine pointing at a cactus wren nest. So they're aptly named, they live in cactus. <laughs> they build their nests out of grasses and you know whatever in the, the most hostile environment possible. Uh, those are choyas. And if you've ever been stuck by a choya, you'll, you won't ever forget it. It really hurts. <laughs> um, and when you're doing this work, you kind of have to watch where you put your feet and obviously where you put your hands. Um, because they stick to your boots, stick to your pants, and if you accidentally squat down and tie your shoe or something like that, then it's then it's in your butt. <laughs> so that's not fun. Um, but one of the things that uh, we did with the cactus wrens is you have to kind of check the the nest for their eggs, and you kind of just stick your hand in the in the nest to, to count eggs. And as you can see, it's really hard to get into. And one day we were uh, checking for eggs. And I think someone had already suggested, like, why don't we get those little, like, me mechanics boroscopes? You can put a little camera in there and check it for anything. Like, oh, there's nothing ever in there. Just, just you know, just stick your hand in there. And it was also, you know, to save from getting stuck by the choya. <clears throat> and uh, that next day, I stuck my hand in a, a nest and felt something a little cold. I'm like, what is that? And then it kind of moved, and I just pulled my hand out really quickly and uh, realized it was a king snake that had eaten all four cactus wren eggs. <laughs> And so when it comes to adaptations, uh, the, the cactus wren are, are a great example because you see how where they put their nest, but they're also in the middle of the food chain, if you want to call it that, uh, where they have predators from the bottom, like coyotes and raccoons and snakes, and then they have raptors from the top. So they're kind of stuck. <laughs> so when your nest is four feet off the ground, you're kind of uh, in the middle there. Um, the joke among uh, bird biologists is, Bird biologists all end up doing butterfly work because when you do bird work, you usually start before sunrise and butterfly work starts around 10 o'clock. So I gladly made the move over to do more butterfly work. Uh, this is a species uh, in Southern California. It's in South LA called the uh, El Segundo Blue Butterfly. They live on the beach, they have one host plant. And so doing surveys where you're out on the beach in July, uh, um, you know, in, in Southern California, it's like, that. it doesn't, doesn't get any better than that. You do look like kind of a weirdo when everyone's out there on the beach and they're in their swim trunks and like having a good time and you're in full sleeves, full pants, sun gloves, big hat, buff, sunglasses and binoculars. And like, who's that guy over there? <laughs> like, yeah, but I get looked at like I'm weird a lot. So um, we actually did a Pelicanus uh, podcast episode on this guy. Um, and so, I, you know, we'll share links later on. Now this butterfly is a different butterfly I've worked on more recently, uh, and it's got the craziest story. It is potentially the rarest butterfly in the world. Um, it actually went extinct for at least 10 years or so. Um, and then in 94, they rediscovered it in San Pedro uh, in the Southwest Los Angeles area. And it's called the Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly. It's in the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And uh, the photo on the top right is uh, a mating pair who are in the process of mating. <laughs> um, the photo in the middle is um, a release we got to do in 2020, where they have a whole captive breeding program after they rediscovered it to bring it back. And they've been doing um, uh, releases at the site that they found them. But then we were able to, with the organization I was working with at the time, we were able to build enough habitat where they were able to restore uh, the proper habitat to then release these butterflies. And then the butterfly on the left is actually a female that is ovipositing or laying eggs. Um, and so when we did this release, everyone was all happy, clapping, people were crying. And I'm not to say that I wasn't emotional, but I was kind of like, all right, well, if these things do really, really well, they last about seven days. And we also did get to see a lot of fly catchers eating about half of them within the first 30 minutes. So when I saw the, the you know, next day or two days later, I saw this female ovipositing. I went, okay, now that's the beginning of the next generation 
of wild palisphorus blue. And so this is what the, the males look like. They're crazy, crazy bright blue. Um, and there's a little video here, uh, just what it looked like and just how vibrant blue they are. And so this is a, another photo of me releasing the palisardus blue. Um, this is a species I've done a, a bit of work on. Uh, they're so cool. They're some of my favorites. I studied urban raptors in my graduate studies. Um, and so I got to do an internship with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife uh, Alliance. And they were doing um, monitoring, but also they moved a population from one site that was going to get developed um, for, for good reasons, not, not a completely just destroying it for like a strip mall or something like that. Um, and so we got to monitor and I got to take these, you know, this probably the best photo I've ever, I've ever taken. I just got lucky that he was sitting right next to the, <laughs> next to the, 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 the road. Um, but we were t talking earlier about how these guys just like, look like, uh, angry bowling pins. <laughs> and actually they, when they try to trap them and they won't get them in the, they can't get them in the trap right away. What they do is they put out a bowling pin that's like painted like a burrowing bo owl. And then the male comes over and just like karate kicks it to the side because they're very territorial. And then they, the trap falls on them. So that's uh, pretty cool. But what we did was took them from this one site and then dropped them into this new site that is actually even better for them. And they built, this is with the uh, San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They built these um, uh, housing pens where they have an artificial burrow underneath. And so then you could release them in there. And then that was, uh, that's hopefully you're gonna start a new population. And so we release a pair in there. And so hopefully they'd stay. And I think about 75% of the pairs they moved over stayed. So again, cool example of, uh, so much effort that goes into saving some of these species. Um, I've been a wild on fire firefighter type two for about eight, nine years. This is, this is my ninth season coming up. Uh, what I do is a, is it called resource advising. So I go on active fires and help mitigate and minimize damage um, from the actual fire, but also um, from the suppression activity. So it's much better to have a fire burn over an area than have, you know, a bunch of dozers <laughs> go through and just destroy it to stop the fire there. So we kind of help make those decisions to protect the, uh, the resources in the area. And bear is burn area emergency response. So it's more after the fire stuff, but it's very similar. Um, and then this is uh, what I am doing now. I work, like I said, I work for the USGS and these are some coworkers of mine. I'll show you a video in a second. Um, where I guess I, I was saying, I work for a guy named Robert Fisher. Um, he has a lab in San Diego um, and he studies everything. Uh, it's all urban wildlife. So he's everything from golden eagles, mountain lions, uh, to salamanders and uh, small mammals, turtles, toads, frogs, everything. So it's it's been, I feel pretty lucky to be able to get involved with everything here. And this uh, video here is a uh, survey that we were doing in a creek that we had not seen the Western pond turtle, a locally sensitive species since I think the early nineties. Um, and we actually got to find, find a couple, um, but this is our, my coworkers doing something called noodling, where they just go through a pool and they stick their hand in holes and stick nets in holes to try to find some, some, uh, some turtles. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't find them in this pool, even though this is a really beautiful pool. We, they were in there because as we walked up, we saw them on the rocks near the bottom, and they saw us from about 100 feet away and just dove into the water. So... It's, uh, it was very exciting to see the turtles, but unfortunately we didn't get the catch and measure and, and do all that kind of work. But I very gladly let, allowed them to stick their hand in the hole so I didn't have to. And so I get the question is, why do I tell you all this? Is it because I need validation and I want you guys all to think of how, how, how cool I am? It's like, no, what I want to do is really share that, you know, all, everything I've just kind of, all these projects I've mentioned, I was one small piece of a giant team. And each of those projects is a giant team. And that realization in about 2014, 2015, really made me realize how many people 
or in this field and how many people are literally dedicating their lives to saving wildlife, to building habitat, to reversing climate change, to studying atmospheric sciences, whatever it is. And I just kind of had that realization. I was like, wait, why don't you ever hear about that on the news? All you ever hear about the environment, you know, whatever that really means, is that uh, it's worse than it's ever been, it's all your fault, and there's nothing you can do about it, so good luck. When in reality, there are hundreds of thousands of people around the world, if not millions, that are doing everything they can to reverse these trends. And so I always use this Paul Hawken, uh, Paul Hawken quote, whereas if, if you don't, if you look at the science and you aren't pessimistic, then you just don't understand it. But if you meet the people and all these organizations that are spending their lives trying to reverse these things and you ha aren't optimistic, then you haven't got a pulse. And I love that quote. And so we based our entire organization around that essentially. And so Pelicanus is a uh, nonprofit that we created in 2020, um, but it's, the project started in 2015 as a podcast. We technically now have four podcast series all on the same feed. Um, and it's all about sharing the good news in conservation. And every time we talk to somebody and say, hey, we'd love to feature you on the podcast, they go, great. I don't really have a lot of good news to tell. And I always have to say, no, 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 you're the good news. You're the, the reason why, you're the reason we want to talk to you. Just the fact that you're doing this, the fact that you go to work every day to save whatever it is. And so we have an uh, original series called Conservation Conversations. It's long form. We talk to people on the front lines of conservation. Our second series is Pelicanus News, where we talk, uh, where my older brother, co-founder of Pelicanus, um, does a short episode every two weeks to talk about the uh, more recent uh, positive headlines in conservation. Our third series uh, is Pelicanus Deep Dives. Um, and actually, our, my younger brother does this, where he takes a topic from the Pelicanus News uh, episodes and just kind of explains it. He's by far the smart one. He's an atmospheric science uh, doctoral candidate at Caltech. So don't ask me what he does. Um, but he, you know, say so we did a, a quick headline on like carbon sequestration. He'll give you four minutes to say, here's how it works, which I still don't really understand, but I think it's really cool that he does it. And our last series is called The Possibilists. Uh, and that is a partnership we have with Reverse the Red. And we'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, but Reverse the Red is this awesome organization that is based off of the uh, the Red the IUCN Red List, which is a global list of species in peril. And it's all about reversing that red and turning them into green and, you know, like the, the, the trend upward for, for uh, wildlife. So I want to kind of highlight some of the people um, and organizations that we've talked with over the years uh, with Pelicanus. Um, and the first one is this absolutely insane animal and awesome person, uh, Dr. Arno Debier. Uh, we did an episode with him a couple years ago about the giant armadillo and giant anteater. And he lives in Brazil and he studies the giant armadillos. And there's, he gives all the cool facts about these things. I mean, look at it, it, it it's just terrifying. <laughs> um, and it's, he says it's about the size of a golden retriever. Um, it's got these giant claws that are like saber tooth tiger fangs. It's got a pig nose. It's got like a hard shell on the outside. It's a crazy, crazy animal. Um, but, and they do all like the normal biological research, but what they also do is they do a community outreach to share with people that these are actually really good for your area, for your farms. They are ecosystem engineers. They build burrows that other things use. Um, and you know, he also has to tell them like, if this thing comes on your property, it's not a demon that's gonna steal your soul and eat your children. It's actually really good. So just let it go, shoo it away, <laughs> it'll be okay. Um, the other species he works on is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, and again, we talked about wildlife and why I'm super into ecology is this, it's all about adaptations. And when you see this, this thing's face, you're like, okay, well, I completely understand what this thing is adapted to. It has a super long tongue and it sticks its entire face 
about two and a half feet <laughs> into a hole to eat insects. Um, and, and you can also see uh, on the, the left there, the giant anteater's babies on its back and the line that goes across its shoulders to its back usually lines up with the baby on top. So the predators can't see that baby as, as easily. And what he's been doing with this project is, uh, again, all the biological research, but then also uh, another uh, campaign to uh, help with people that are driving through town um, and on the highways. I guess the giant anteaters don't have the typical eye shine you see it with uh, mammals at night. And so they have signs everywhere that say like, slow down, go the speed limit and keep an eye out for giant anteaters. So it's like basically giant anteater crossing signs. And so they, they've actually been pretty successful in, in uh, saving these species from declining further. Um, again, you talk about adaptation. Here's a, a local species to us out just a couple hours away in the desert. We went to Joshua Tree National Park to talk to the biologists there. And they, did, they do this, this long-term monitoring study for desert tortoise. And the little putty thing you see on its shell is actually a, a GPS uh, receiver so you go out with the telemetry and it just beeps every few seconds. And then as you, you know, wave the wand around, you find it. And then you take all the measurements and they, they're monitoring their population to make sure that it's uh, doing okay. And then they also do a lot of um, outreach for people that it's one of the highest visited parks in the country, um, especially around Coachella. <laughs> and so they have a lot of signs that are like, you know, speeding kills wildlife. And these guys like to cross roads a lot. And so obviously if you hit him, you crush him. Um, but again, this animal just is mind blowing because you think you're like, oh, it's, you know, it's a tortoise. It has, it has this hard shell on the outside and it lives inside. It's like, no, it is the shell. <laughs> and when you realize that it's just, for whatever reason, like I, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but I still get blown away by things like this. Um, and then the one on the right, you can see about to be let go back into its burrow. It has a little, lever underneath its chin that um, the, the males like to uh, fight each other over territory and they'll literally flip each other over <laughs> if they're angry enough. <laughs> uh, another local species, the California red-legged frog. We talked to Dr. Katie Delaney at uh, Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area um, and they did this really cool uh, reintroduction study as they had one of the last remaining populations of California red-legged frogs in Southern California. I think at the time there was maybe two populations and this is the only viable one. And so they did a ton of restoration and for a stream work like this, the restoration means they have to get rid of the invasive species like crayfish and bullfrogs. And so they took these egg masses from the good population and moved it to a new area and it was highly successful and it was awesome. And then the entire mountain range burned in a fire in 2018. Um, and I was, I was on that fire and luckily it burned over the source population and it, luckily no major issues, but one of the uh, areas that they restored did get filled in with sediment because it got rain a few days later. Um, but they're not giving up. And again, the whole idea is that they're doing awesome work to save these species. And so we've got this cool video that she provided where they're releasing the red-legged frog tadpoles into a stream for the first time. And they're just so cool watching them swim. And these frogs are big. They're like bigger than my hand. And when you see them, they actually do have red, red, red legs. <laughs> um, and so this is Dr. Gladys. If you don't know about Dr. Gladys, please listen and watch our episode do any research you want to find and find out more about Dr. Gladys. She is the next Jane Goodall. She is as she's up there. She, she should be the biggest name in conservation. I think it, she will, she will be soon. She has a new book out. Please support her and her organizations as much as possible. She literally tripled the population of mountain gorillas in Southern Uganda over 20 years. And they did this through social programs. So the, she has an organization called CTPH, it's Conservation, Conservation Through Public Health. And what they did is they worked with the local communities to make sure people were healthy, they had jobs, and they were living sustainably in the land. 
And one of the ways they did this is by providing jobs through coffee farming. And so they have a coffee company um, and I've actually bought this coffee. It's very good. Um, and so they have taught the local people how to grow coffee sustainably and also through community outreach has shared that when a gorilla does come into your coffee farm, there's, you don't have to kill it. You don't have to shoot it away. There's no bad juju from it. It's just, they're in there. You kind of move it up, move it away. It'll go, go back home. But you, it, through this sustainable farming, it's gotten them to stop slash and burn. And it's, like I said, it's tripled the populations of mountain gorillas. And now they're expanding this program to other areas of Uganda, Northern Uganda, and surrounding countries. And they're trying to expand to get the mountain gorilla populations up everywhere. So please look into Dr. Gladys. She deserves all the praise she can get. Um, and then I think this is our my last uh, episode I'm gonna kind of highlight. Uh, we are lucky, we were lucky enough, to, not last summer, but the summer before, to go to Belize and work with an organization who is our, one of our partners now called Toucan Ridge Education, Ecology and Education Society. It's in the center of Belize up in the mountains. Really, really cool place. You can actually stay there. It's kind of like a hostel kind of thing, but they, they set out to build a uh, ecological observatory, a research station. And so we talked to them about bats. Um, they have a bird observatory. They do a lot of work with turtles. They have camera uh, uh, trap footage of uh, jaguars, but again, we talk about bats. And so this is how you catch bats and birds as well as you put up this thing called a mist net. You can see there's two bats there and she's pulling one out and she's got like a golf glove on to not get bit. Um, and so when you catch the bats, you have to pull them out of the net and then you take them back to a banding station where you take all the measurements, you take all the health, uh, you weigh them, you sometimes you take a blood sample, uh, you, you get the species, the sex, uh, you check it for ticks, all those kinds of things. Um, and then we, you, it's, it's, it's just so cool watching them. And this thing, I think this one is called a, a leaf nose bat. If you look on the, you can kind of see them more on the, the, the image on the right. It looks like it has a little leaf on its nose. Um, and they've been able to discover, like not discover species, but like really solidify the, the diversity of the bat species in their area. And what they've been able to do in that area is, is just so cool. And so this is super creepy to me, but it's so cool to watch them fly. And so you can kind of see it here where they, you think all oh, the bats have wings, but really what it is, is their arms and hands have adapted to have super long spindly fingers that have thin layers of, a uh, thin layer of skin in between. And I don't know why, but I never really, re I guess I realized that, but like when, once you actually see it up close, it kind of like grosses you out. So when you see them fly, it's just the coolest thing ever. So yeah, they've been able to do a lot of really great bat research, bird work. Um, they've been able to help discover species. And so again, it's just another example of all these organizations that are around the world that do such great work. Um, and we, this is another quote from a, a, a Southern California biologist who uh, shaped a lot of conservation biology when he's asked if he's optimistic or pessimistic about the future of our environment. Again, whatever that means, he responded, he's possibilistic. So that if we put the right knowledge, resources, and attitude towards a problem, we can fix it. And that's what conservation is. And so I'd like to thank um, all of our partners. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have really great partners, like I said, with Reverse the Red. Um, we have a, a new series with them, um, or it's the, it's the Possibilist. It's now with them, which every two months we're gonna release an episode. Um, and then there's gonna be a global action um, uh, plan uh, for the next two months afterwards. So currently we're in the, the bird. Uh, uh, window here. And so we just did an episode with the Laura Parquet Foundation and talked about some of the birds that they've brought back. I think it was nine different species they've, they've uh, bumped up on the, in the oops, so sorry. <laughs> uh, hit the wrong button. Um, and so this is one of the, the species that they were able to uh, bump up a couple notches on the list. 
um, the leaders of Macaw. Uh, Peppermint Narwhal, they are the organization that does these drawings. And you can, as you can tell, they're amazing. And they have, a, check out their website. They sell calendars, they sell t-shirts. They have amazing, amazing artwork that's all conservation based. Trees Belize, as I, I mentioned, uh, we have a local organization, uh, Tidal Influence, who, who's helped us out over the years. And then Project Dragonfly um, is my uh, alma mater for uh, my graduate studies. They are a really good program that's, uh, it's a graduate program uh, across the nation, and we are lucky enough and fortunate enough to create a scholarship for graduate students that uh, is open until I think tomorrow is the last day. So if you're a Project Dragonfly student, please apply, um, and we'll close it tomorrow. And uh, once a year, we release an episode about the scholarship winner, just to kind of see what uh, the grad students or projects, what kind of projects they're working on. Um, so with that. With my information, reach out with any questions, follow us on social media. We're on YouTube. You can find us on any podcast service you use. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Austin. That's a great and incredible like breadth of work and just all of the different things you've um, you've done and been a part of. Um, I wanted to note if anyone has any comments, just add them to um, the chat wherever you're watching and we'll be sure to ask Austin while we're doing this. But um, we have a couple uh, panelists here to ask you some questions in person as well. So I wanted to welcome Christian Cave uh, and he's going to ask you the first couple. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you. I really enjoyed your talk. It's just so incredible to see all your work and all the projects that have been going on. It's yeah, hard. thanks for being here. Um, my first question would be, uh, what do you say to discourage youth who feel as issues like climate change and wildlife loss are an insurmountable force? That's the big question. That's the, that's the hardest part. That's it. They talk about Gen Z and, you know, just kind of getting bored into the situation. Um, so it's hard because I, what I want to say is humans solve problems. This is what we do. This is how we've gotten to the situation we're in is that you solve a problem and it leads to a better problem. And so conservation and endangered species, climate change, these are just problems that we need to solve. And we have the resources, we have the knowledge, we just have to have the right attitude to put toward it. So if we can get young people, especially to start moving that direction and whether they're a biologist or an engineer or a doctor, whatever, if they all start thinking in the, with the vein of conservation, easily fixed. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, and then my last question is, is how do you and your team assess which endangered species needs a conservation effort in terms of priority over others? Because I know there's a lot, you know. No, totally. Um, and it, when you ask, when you say my team, when it comes to Pelicanus, we'll talk to anybody. <laughs> if you're working on cool species, we'll talk to you. There's no there's no vetting process. Yes. Just we will have we want to talk to you. Because again, we're trying to share that there's so many people out there doing this. Um, for like the actual work side of things, it, a lot of it's based off of uh, long-term data sets and you can see how things are declining or not. Um, and then exploratory research. It, it's hard to fund that kind of stuff because there isn't sometimes a, a product out of it. You know, you can write a paper and you can get it published, but it kind of just says, yeah, you know, no real conclusions. But so it's harder to get funded for those kinds of things. But when you do that, you can really find out how things are going. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Christian. We have um, Alex Thomas from OSearch up next with a couple of questions for you as well. Hi, Austin. Thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank um, you. Very informative. Um, I'm Alex Thomas. I am the program and educate. Age, education coordinator for OSEARCH. We're a nonprofit focused on white shark research and education. Um, through our education programs, we aim to inspire people of all ages to learn more about white sharks and become <laughs> advocates for their protection and ocean, ocean conservation. So some of my questions for you, as the co-founder and president of Pelicanus, how do you see your nonprofit making a difference in the world of conservation? And what do you hope to share as your message? You know, we're, we're really just trying to get people involved. Um, 
I kind of said it already, but, you know, whether it inspires students to get into biology, become wildlife biologists, conservation scientists in any way, great. That's not really our goal. We, we want, we need people from wildlife biologists to engineers, to bankers, to whoever, to be, have this kind of mindset. Not everyone can be a wildlife biologist. It's just not the way it works. And so if everyone in the world can think this way and, and realize that good things are happening and that conservation works, we hope that people will be inspired to then get involved in that, that local organizations, you know, donations, voting a certain way, whatever it is. Yeah, I completely agree with that. You know, just me as I'm not a marine biologist, but here I am involved in OSEARCH as a program coordinator for education. And you know, just like Megan, she's involved in development. So we all we all can have a part. Um, you know, my follow up question will be, what do you believe are the most critical steps we can take to project protect endangered species? So I think that completely depends on where you are, where you are. So here in Southern California, uh, it's all about habitat in my mind, because there's so little of it. Um, and if you like ever get like an aerial view of, of Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, it's just the little slivers of green in between all the houses and development. It's like, how are these species, like any species still here? And so there's like, like the El Segundo Blue Butterfly I mentioned, um, one of the organizations that we did a podcast episode on, they focus on trying to get people to build habitat in their yards. If you live in a, within a third of a mile of the coast, which you'd be very fortunate if you do live in a third of a mile of the coast in Los Angeles, you can afford to build habitat in your yard. Take out your lawn, put in local native plants, and you can provide habitat for an endangered species. Um, but yeah, it just depends on where you're at. Absolutely. Thank you. But get involved. That's the big thing. Get involved. That is, that's the big message. Find your way. That is your passion. Thanks, Alex. And thanks for those answers, Austin. Um, we also have uh, Shannon Lloyd, who's one of Headwaters board members. Hi, um, Austin. Very interesting talk. You've had an interesting career. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, so uh, one of the things I was sort of concerned about or, or interested in, um, uh, what areas have you gone into in California um, as a, an advised um, from the, the burn perspective? Oh, yeah. Um, so I got lucky early on to do a lot of fires in Oregon. Um, which was pretty fun because I got to get completely out of my own element and just go to Oregon and just camp in the woods for two weeks. <laughs> um, but it, here in Southern California, um, we've had a, unfortunately had a couple big mega fires in the last few years. So like the, the Woolsey fire um, in Los Angeles that burned the area that I was talking about with the red-legged frogs. There's the Thomas fire in Santa Barbara. And these are all like, you know, 100, 200, 300,000 acre fires. And that's all different types of habitat, um, you know, from very, very coastal to up in the mountains. Um, and so the, the resource concerns are, you know, different from fire to fire. It could be, you know, water quality. It could be, you know, are they just putting dozer lines through, through stream beds, those kinds of things. So it really just depends on the fire um, and, and the resources that are there. But, you know, in Oregon, it's about, hey, don't cut down the snacks because uh, spotted owls like those. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, so I'm located in the Sierras, and um, so have you done anything up here? Or I was in one fire up there in 2016. It was a relatively small fire, um, but it was in an area that needed to burn, and so it was like a small, like thousand acre fire. Or, yeah, I think it was like a thousand acres, um, and they wanted to turn it into like a much bigger fire because they would need that area to burn because it, had, it hadn't burned in like 150 years or something. So they needed to clear out some of the brush and all the dead wood. And so they built a big, they call it building a big box so it won't escape from that. And so they put down fire to then burn it, not quite artificially. Um, and then they got an early snow and they put it out like almost within like a few days. Oh no. <laughs> so they only burned like 30,000 acres, but they wanted to get like something like 50 or 60, but yeah. And then what, what kind of, were you um, advising on critters or uh, just how, 
like habitats or just um yeah, it's, it's generally just habitat. Just uh, you know, when they're building these big boxes, they they base you know they put in line, and so that depends on the agency involved. So either they put uh, bulldozers in and just clear out you know ten to thirty foot wide, where they take all the way down to the mineral soil, so the fire cannot carry across it. And then they also have to clear some of the brush and and like you know cut down trees and limb up trees, so the fire can't carry that way. And so I'm there just going to help make sure that like it's called minimum impact suppression tactics. So mm. they're, they're doing everything necessary to stop the fire, but they're not going overboard and destroying the habitat in the meantime. Because yes, the fire does damage, but I read some, I watched a talk the other day where saying like it's less than 3% of wildlife um, dies in fires on average. It's like less, it's very, very small. Like not a lot of wildlife actually perishes from the fire. But the damage that comes from suppression afterwards takes decades, if not hundreds of years, to recover from. Because if you cut it down to like just the rock, bare, bare soil, that you have to push all that back. And so we do a lot of repair work as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So along those lines and kind of thinking about the red-legged frog uh, habitat that got destroyed because of the landslide afterwards. Um, hmm. uh, so have you had any other sites that have been impacted by um uh flows like like that like land, land landslides and and post fire scar uh soils that have just come loose um and what do you think about your research that you've been doing in relation to the um atmospheric rivers we've been having in california yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's sorry, pretty... a lot of questions there actually. No, no, it's fine. And the the rain is obviously good. Um, it's a net positive for sure. But yes, in some of these areas that recently burned, like I was on a fire in September down in San Diego near the border, um, and we did all the the bear stuff, the burden area emergency response. It's like after the fire, and that's where you're not think looking at the um, impacts of suppression tactics. You're more thinking about the fire effects. So you have these really steep canyon walls that burn very, very hot. So it's moonscaped, it's all just, just like black soil. As soon as it rains, it's all coming down. And then you think of the effects on the creek. And so if that creek has endangered arroyo toads or western pond turtles, it's either that creek's going to get completely filled in or it's super silty where they can't live in that. It's anoxic and plants don't grow as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a major concern and there's not a whole, in some areas you can do some mitigation work by doing, um, erosion control. You can, when we, when they put in lines on steep slopes, you can go put in water bars to kind of like spread out the erosion. So it's not just one big channel that coming down the side of the hill. Um, but some of these areas, and especially if it's a 200, 300,000 acre fire, you know, what can you do? It's just, you just have to. Pray that the rain doesn't all come down at once. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that, how do they resource those sort of uh, um, restoration projects? I mean, is it is it a, are you the only guy out there or are they they with the big acreage? Do they have a lot of manpower? Yes, yeah, so this is all federal. So I only work on federal fires. Um, actually, that's not true. Um, but it's I. I hired through the federal federal government. So if it's forest service land, BLM land, park service land. And so when it's fire, uh, when it's on the fire active incident, that's emergency funds from FEMA. And so that's all set aside before the year. It's like, Hey, we think it's going to be cost about this much money. And, you know, I'm out there and I'm making, I'm making good money, but it's, you know, <laughs> you, those VLACs that come and drop the retardant down on the, the fire, those are like a million and a half dollars a day, something like that. <laughs> and so they're just dumping a ton of money into, into saving it. And then it's part of that that they allocate toward it is the restoration side of it. And so, like I said, for the fire down in San Diego that we were in in September, um, we wrote this document uh, called emergency stabilization. So we got about $900,000 to restore the area and make sure that uh, in, it's not infiltrated with invasive species like mustards and thistles and those kinds of things, um, but then also to uh, keep the stream beds healthy for the endangered species that live there. Oh, wow, that's great. Um, okay, unrelated to that, but um, curious, are you looking at uh, bird populations um, down in the Salton Sea area at all? And um, the sort of... Uh, 
problems that are down there with regard to particulate matter that's coming up from the dried seabed. And I know now there's more water down there, but has that been an area that you've looked at at all? I've never actually done any work out there. Uh, I grew up about an hour from there. <laughs> so we would go there a lot as kids. Um, I hated it when I was a kid, but now it's still, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, because yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's such a unique site environmentally. And I remember studying it in college and just, you know, hearing all about it. Um, so I don't know the more recent details about it and I've never done any research out there, but it is a really, really cool site. And I know it fluctuates between being an awesome site for birds and then massive die offs of fish and nothing can go. And then like 10 years later, it's all there again. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting spot. Um, okay, final question. <laughs> where um, Where is the burrowing owl habitat? Uh, they like kind of flatter areas, grassland areas. Um, they will go into shrubby areas. Um, and if I remember right correctly, they're found in a lot of the U.S. and into Mexico, Central America. Uh, you'll find them in Florida, Texas, the South, um, <clears throat> and then... More specifically, the, the work we were doing was on the Southern California population because, like I said, all the habitat has been anywhere flat in Southern California has been developed, essentially. <laughs> and so you, especially in San Diego, you're like, okay, here's all the flat areas are houses and development and all the hillsides are the preserves. And so you kind of think of like, how does that affect things? So especially for species like the, that need grassland, there's not a whole lot of it left. It's something like 1% is left in Southern California is left. Okay, so, so they're parts. they're like they're more desert uh, meadow or kind of what what exactly like is it is it dry or? Yeah, I would say so. I think they're they're adaptable, right. and I think there are certain subspecies that can go in more tropical areas. Um, but he, definitely here, it's it's pretty pretty dry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very well, dry. again, thank you. This has been really interesting, and and thanks for answering all my questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Shandon. Um, we have at least one question from the audience here. Um, and I'm actually going to add uh, just a little bit to it because I know you always ask how people got involved to begin with. And so I'm going to turn that question back on you. So what first inspired you to become an endangered species, you know, biologist, what inspired you to work on wildlife? And then mm -hmm. what has been the most rewarding experience if you can pick one of your career so far? How did I get involved? Uh, like I said, we kind of always, my dad was a birder. We'd go out and we'd kind of get dragged along just to go outside and go do something. And I don't say we hated it, but we hated some of it. <laughs> we'd go to like the central coast, California. We loved going out there, but I was like, you know, go look at birds. Like really? Um, but then as we got older, we kind of, all three of us kind of gravitated towards this field. Um, and so I, I guess that's how we got into it. I've always loved animals. Um, uh, you know, dog lover, you know, tried to have as many pets as I possibly could. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so then when I kind of was trying to figure out which way to go with the career, this just made sense. Um, and strangely enough, or maybe not strangely enough, I don't know, but everyone I talked to in high school and college that said, this is kind of what I want to do. It was like, no, why would you do that? There's no jobs. How are you going to find a job? And so I just went, oh, all right, I guess I can't do that. So once I kind of realized that it was up to me, um, you know, not my parents, I'm saying like more like, you know, school counselors, <laughs> when I said I wanted to like, how, how are you going to make a living doing that? And in one way they were right. <laughs> um, but in another way, you know, it, it does take a very long time. Um, but, you know, eventually I got there. Uh, it, it just, it's, it's a, it is a difficult thing to get into. Um, but yeah, I think, that's what it was. It just, and then once you get into biology, like how do you get into biology and not get into conservation, conservation biology? I don't know. Cause that's where all the interesting work is. And as I said, I'm urban uh, wildlife biologist. as contradictory as that sounds, this is kind of where all the most interesting work is being done because that's where all the problems are, not all the problems, but where a lot of the bigger problems are. And in Southern California, we're kind of a cool hub for it because we're facing a lot of the problems that areas like, uh, suburban Chicago, suburban Portland, Oregon, some of these areas that are expanding over the last 20 years. Um, we've gone through the same problems, but it was 30 years ago to now. And they're like, hey, how do we save 
these birds that were, you know, disappearing because it's like, well, you, maybe you can try what we did, you know? Um, so I guess it's along the same lines and to answer this question is the most rewarding experience. Um, nothing beats reintroductions. Like when you're able to release a butterfly or move a, an endangered species from one area to another, it's like, it's, that's as cool as it gets, you know? And you, you, the last thing you want to see is a, a species disappear. And so if you're able to be a part of the project in any way to then bring some back, that's why we're doing it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I love to hear you talk about butterflies and, and, you know, tortoises and frogs and some of the more or less uh, charismatic things, you know, uh, charismatic megaphone always gets all of the all of the hype and, and a lot of the story, but um, some of these smaller species, you know, get a bunch of work and it's and it's really exciting and all of that is is awesome. Yeah, um, I completely forgot to even say why we're called Pelicanus. <laughs> um, we're, it's our like host species or, or flagship species because in the seventies, it was on the endangered species list and all because of a chemical that we use called DDT uh, that got into the, the environment and eventually things that are higher up on the food web um, had effects from this chemical that was in the water and the fish. I don't know if you can hear that. It was a car accident outside. <laughs> um, and we were able to ban that uh, substance and this species, the California brown pelican, as well as others, were able to recover over you know, 30, 40, 50 years and they completely come back. So it's, again, that's as cool as it gets. And so we want pelicanus to be uh, the, uh, the model for how to bring species back and how to, you know, right the wrongs. Yeah. That, that symbol of hope sort of thing is, is awesome. Um, can you, uh, talk a little bit about the importance of science education and inspiring the next generation of scientists? Uh, you mentioned project dragonfly and, uh, headwaters does a ton of science education work. Um, and, uh, there might be some students who are interested in pursuing a path uh, maybe like yours yeah it, it's as important as anything and that you know we're technically an environmental uh, education nonprofit because that's what we're doing we're trying to educate people on cool facts about wildlife and you know some of the species i showed but also kind of to say like hey there are these efforts going on that you don't hear about on mainstream news or whatever and so if you can get involved with organizations um, like this one or look into your, your local organizations. There's, there's national organizations like Audubon or Xerxes and they have local offices that you can get involved with. Um, but it's, it's as important as, as anything. And like I said, Project Dragonfly is, uh, is a really cool program and it, it's, it's all about, doing something for conservation, not just like, hey, let me go study the species and write a paper that no one's going to read, you know, n no, <laughs> I won't go any further than that, but it, they do uh, do a lot of really cool work. And again, we, we, we like to highlight the work that's being done and help out where we can. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, I have a couple, I'll just uh, throw up Pelicanus again there. And um, you mentioned some of the episodes that are already out, but is there anything upcoming that's super exciting and uh, just talk about where to find you? Yeah, we, so you can find us on social media at Pelicanus uh, Inc. Um, we just released an episode last week about uh, sharks with David Schiffman, um, why sharks matter. He wrote a book, so promote his book. Um, he's done doing global shark research and, and education um, and pretty soon we'll be do, doing as i mentioned with the reverse the red we have the series uh, the possibilists we released uh, in february uh, species about the laura parquet foundation and all the amazing work they're doing there and in the next few months we'll be doing an episode on um, reptiles and amphibians uh, and so we'll do a two-month uh, global action um, uh, outreach uh, program to get people to get involved at uh, a local organization. Um, and then on every 1st and 15th of the month, the Pelicanus News comes out. 
Um, but yeah, engage with us on social media, ask us questions, reach out to me if you want to want to help us out. We're we're technically a global organization. So if you have anything you want to help us out with, you know somebody we could talk to, you're a social media person, you're a, an editor, whatever, we, we, we need the help. So please reach out. We want to talk to you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us and, and answering all of the questions. Uh, I think Meg's going to come back on and has a little bit of a wrap up from Headwaters. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, thank you, Austin. It was really interesting to hear about your work. I, in my PhD, studied barn owls in the Central Valley, which are obviously not endangered, but um, are being used by a lot of ranches for rodent control instead of using things like pesticides. So it was pretty cool. While I was working there, I had an awesome opportunity to work on some burrowing owl populations that are in the Central Valley, which is actually a great place for it. It's good burrowing owl yeah, habitat yeah. near Merced area. Yeah. Yeah, the barn owls are cool because they, they look like ghosts when they fly and you can't hear them. They're just so cool when they fly by. Yeah, they are so cool. They're almost dead silent and they um, predominantly hunt with their ears, which a lot of people don't know. Um, their ears are offset on the two sides of their head and they kind of use that heart-shaped face almost like echolocation type um, and can differentiate species while flying. Well, so like in studies that have been done, they'll preferentially go after their favorite species even while they can't see them. I, I don't, that's what I'm talking about, like adaptations. Like how are you not blown away by this and just like, this is so cool, I want to learn more about it. Yes. <laughs> um, that's, I mean sort of one of the ways I ended up getting into education is I had a ton of kids that came out and worked with me when I was doing that. And we had kids building nest boxes and selling them to the ranchers. And I don't know, it was like a whole community thing. It was really cool. awesome. And I was just like, how do you get kids more involved in science? And also like knowing that it's not just memorization of facts, but it's things that are being done, like how you ask a question is a process. And so that's sort of how I ended up here. Yeah, no, I'm like, I always say it and, you know, I'm basically just a seven year old still am. And so I, I'm, I, like I said, I did work with raptors and I love it and anything that can just kill and eat something with its face is cool to me. So I'm like, sure. Yeah. And so it, you can kind of share that kind of like, Hey, I can be a professional biologist and still just think this is super cool and not have to be like, Oh, well, you know, what are the statistics significance? It's like, no, no, forget all that. Just be excited about it first. And then you can learn all the stuff you need to learn. Yeah. Have an interest. I mean, that's, we try to pull that out of kids. Like, what are you interested in? How do you ask a question around that? You know, how do you discover, like, what's that process? How do you find things? And yeah, I and think that's the rest of it's easy once, do you know what I mean? Like once it's your thing, it's like, Ooh, I want to see what this adds up to, you know, then like, looking to graph something or whatever makes a ton more sense, but like, it's not really fun to dig through someone else's data <laughs> before no, you no, For sure. And you know, and, and that's what Project Dragonfly is all about. It's all about, uh, you know, inquiry. You're just teaching you to like learn just from what you're seeing. And a lot of people in the program are teachers. So they're learning how to take that little more higher level um, of, of, you know, inquiry and learning and then sharing that with their students and doing projects with them. And so, yeah, they do a lot of cool work all over the, all over the country and internationally as well. I got to go to Peru and, and uh, look at birds through that program. So, uh, you know, there's a podcast about that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's, that sounds a lot in line with what, what we do. And, you know, yeah. I think like for right now, it's Citizen Science Month and we have some materials that people can look at. And I think, um, you know, you can use our hashtag at Headwater Side to share things with us or, um, and Citizen Science Month. And I think, you know, if people would like to investigate their own research project. We have programs, um, the project you were just talking about. Um, I think there's a lot of things. So, yeah, we have a research experience that's a semester long. We have some summer research programs where you get to go to Weber Lake. It's outside of Truckee and work with environmental scientists and um study things. I mean, we've had kids who come thinking like, oh yeah, I want to study like water quality and things. And then there's all these like geese out there and they're just so drawn to the animals and they end up choosing a totally different project, which is awesome. Or even the, there's so many like butterflies and insects and stuff in that meadow. And, you know, it's just funny how people change when you're there and experiencing it. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the last thing I say. You know, people ask me, how do I get involved? What do I how what do I do? It feels such a big, big problem, but community science, citizen science is a really great way to do it. You know, there's a really cool app, iNaturalist. Um, yep. and it, that's a really great way to learn because you take photos of it and you post it. And there's a bit of an AI thing that kind of tells you what they think it is. And then people that are really good at what they do in identifying these things will tell you, actually, no, it's this plant, or it's this bug or whatever. So yeah, it's a, it's a great way to get into it. And then a lot of people do use it for real data. So it's yep. a great way to actually help out too. Yeah, I was gonna say there's lots of groups that look for things. Um, I, like my undergrad research, we had people looking for box turtles and just taking a simple GPS location. And it was super helpful for us to just know where things were located. So there's a lot of stuff like that out there. And we're here to help if people need to figure out how to access something near them. Um, you know, and again, if they want help, we have mentors and you know, you could start your own project. I mean, we also work in schools. Um, and try to get kids out. That's awesome. Again, there's so many organizations like like you guys, and it's like it, it's just so cool to see that everyone is doing such a really good job. And you know, I, I love the work that you guys do. Well, we really appreciate you being here, and I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening, and our panelists and our community. Um, we couldn't do this without you. Um, and yeah, this event is free. Obviously, we got some contributions from some people. So thank you to those who contributed to help make this happen. Um, our next event is on April 21st um, to celebrate Earth Day. Actually, on April 20th, we have a co-hosted event. Shandon's doing it with Serene Lakes. And it's on, um, I don't know, sort of weather. It's somebody from Open Snow. Um, and then we have Earth Day, um, which we're doing, Alex, with OSearch. Um, so thank you to OSearch as well. And then on May 4th, um, we have Laurel Larson, who's uh, joining us for the Big Day of Giving. And she's talking about the Delta Watershed um, project and sort of climate change there. So um, we are always trying to get information out. Um, so this is one way. And obviously with Pelicanus, uh, listen to their podcast and uh, look at their materials as well. So thank you all. And I hope you have a great night.